So last week I went on holiday. I went down to the Gower Peninsula, which is the, the southwest part of Wales, um, sort of southwest of Swansea, right down by the beach. Very, very nice beaches, lovely weather. It was a beach holiday with the family. And I um, experienced Molly in the sea. Now at first she was a little bit, mm, shall I go in, shall I not? These waves are a bit weird. But soon, um, within a day, she absolutely loved it. And to put the, the cherry on top of the cake, she really loved it when I was in the water with her too. Um, it was warm enough to go out swimming and she would see me and run down the beach and jump across all the waves and swim out to me and swim around me and we, we would have a play. Because um, of course she's never seen me in the water before. I certainly wouldn't go in the canal or the rivers. Um, rivers are probably clean enough, but canals certainly aren't very clean. Um, and that was a new experience for her. She thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, it was a nice relaxing week. And um, I got back on Saturday, picked my boat up, and everything was fine. It obviously got quite warm inside the boat because the thermometer inside was registering 38 degrees so obviously they had a bit of sun up here as well but everything's fine nice and safe um, and I'm now cruising um, north again so as soon as I said I was going on holiday um, I had loads and loads of comments on YouTube about what would you mean going on holiday you're already on a lifetime holiday yes now we're boating and cruising along nice canals like this is nice and it's a holiday bit but living off grid can actually be quite difficult you've got to constantly think about your water consumption where you're going to get water again um, what the level of your water is and then you've got your power what sort of power um, percentage of battery power you've got do you need to charge um, are you pointing your solar panels in the right direction are they even in enough light so that you can get enough solar all these things you need to, to take into consideration. You also don't have a car right next to your boat. Well, I don't at the moment. Um, so you have to fill it with food and get your fridge full and stock up um, in advance. Otherwise you go a bit hungry. So yes, living on an hour boat is like a constant holiday and it's really lovely and it's stress-free and it's very peaceful but you don't have to have to do quite a lot of work and then there's all the fit out I've, I'm aware that I've got absolutely masses to go I've got painting the boat outside to do I've got lining it out inside I've got to finish off the electrics there's all these things this never ending list of jobs and we mustn't forget these videos either it takes around 20 minutes of filming for every video minute and an edit like this took a whole day to complete. And if that wasn't enough, I also work online part time to earn a living. So a complete break was very welcome. Ashwood Marina is southwest of Birmingham, and although quite close to Britain's second largest city, you'd never know it, as the canal is set in complete countryside. I headed up the Staffordshire and Worcestershire Canal to Greensforge, where I filled up with water. I then travelled up to just north of Dimmingsdale Bridge, where it was quiet and away from the hustle and bustle. So Molly and I are now walking back to the marina, uh, where I left my car. I have a car at the moment because um, I need to go to, to workshops and places to get wood and timber and everything. I would say it's probably the most difficult part of continuously cruising is having a car because you've got to, got to constantly move it ahead or go and collect it. Um, I do that in a number of means. I do it, um, I either walk if it's quite close by. Um, I've got a foldable bike. Um, important to fold up so then it takes less space inside the boat um, but I've got a foldable bike and I can go back and forth and put it in the car and fold it up and move on or sometimes I get um, an uber taxi or buses it really depends on where I am and what the route is but I try and 
keep the car with me as much as possible or close by on a on neighboring roads or on a near a bridge that goes over the canal because you never know when you're going to need it um, there's not just the shopping and buying fit out equipment but sometimes you want to go and see friends or go and pick stuff up from the storage unit or whatever so I think at the moment a car is really vital for me long term um, lots of narrow voters don't have cars or if they do they're based and stored away somewhere um, I don't know long term I think I do need a car for the short term anyway I've had lots of questions and requests about locks and how they work and how I get through them on my own it's simply a way to move a boat from one water level to another. I find going upstream easier than going down, as there is less risk. The stretch of water between locks is called a pound. I've moored my boat to the bank before the lock, using a rope connected to the top middle eye of my boat. This is called the centre line. I'll be going upstream through this lock, and it's not in my favour. This means the water level in the lock chamber is the same as the pound above, and not the same level as my boat. Before I do anything though, I need to check and listen to see if a boat is coming in the opposite direction. If there were, I need to let them go through the lock first, as the lock is in their favour. For me to enter the lock, I need to drain the water out of the lock chamber, open the bottom gates and move Alice in. You operate lock paddles with a windlass. They're either made from aluminium or steel. As I need to empty the lock of water, I will wind the gate paddles up in the lower gate, releasing the water. Slowly, the water level decreases and empties down to the level of the pound my boat is in. This lock has two half gates. I put pressure on the balance beam and before long it'll start to open. If the water level hasn't equaled, regardless how strong you think you are, you'll never open the gate, so it's best just to wait. Once both bottom gates are open, I untie the centre line and go back on board Alice and navigate her into the lock chamber. Roofs of narrowboats are not like cars, they're built to be walked on. There are supporting struts built into the frame and mine has 4mm thick steel throughout its entire length. I climb up onto the roof of Alice, making sure I have my windlass and centre line. I then need to climb up the lock chamber's ladder to the surface. This lock isn't very deep, but sometimes it's quite a climb and the ladders are always wet and slimy. I wrap my centre line relatively loosely around one of the bollards and let the rope out towards the top gate. I now close the two half gates and ensure their paddles are closed in their down position. This lock has two ground paddles. These allow water to enter the lock chamber from the higher canal pound, but all below the waterline of the boat. There's a small walkway across the water built into the top gate. To keep Alice forward within the lock, and as there is a metal plate built into the lock gate, I keep the boat in forward gear, but only at tick over. This tries to move the boat forward slightly, but this keeps the boat in control, especially when you're on your own. I also keep an eye on the ropes and the general position of Alice in the lock. As the lock fills, you can gently open the paddles in the top gate itself. This opens a hole in the gate and it needs to be done once the lock water level is above the paddle holes or you risk flooding your bow deck with water. It's always best to take your time going through a lock. There can be huge volumes of water to transfer and it can move your boat around at quite some force. This can not only empty kitchen cupboards all over the floor but also damage the lock gates, sides and your own boat. Once Alice is at the same height as the top pound, I put the boat into neutral, open the top gate, lower both ground paddles and gate paddle and bring the centreline rope back on board. I then very slowly move Alice just forward of the top gate and hop off, close the gates behind me and hop back on, all with no mooring required. If you work a narrowboat single-handed, there's a great little book called Going It Alone. 
it has masses of little hints and tips to make solo navigation easier and safer. I've included a link to it in the description below. It was great to see lots of Canal and River Trust volunteers at Whitewick Mill Lock, making the place look nice and tidy. I quite like this bit, waiting for the lock to fill or empty. You've got your bum against the, the beam of the, the top gate, because I'm going upstream. And there's no point in pushing it, no point in shoving it, because even like a centimetre of difference between the pound above and the, the actual chamber water level can mean that you really can't open the gate because there's so much pressure. But sit nice and, wait nice and steady, lean up against the beam and just wait for the water levels to ease and then the pure weight of yourself against the beam will gently open the gate and this is the time when it's really peaceful. You can't do anything else, you just gotta wait. Having not gone through many staircase locks on my own, it was a relief to see bratch locks near Wombourne were manned by volunteers. Because the last person coming through the lock has gone downstream and I want to go upstream, we've now got to drain all the locks for me to navigate in. So I've just spoken to the lock keeper and he, I'm going to drain the, the bottom lock and he's going to He's going to work on the, the other two. So I'm sat in the bottom chamber of Bratch Locks. There are three here, and there's a rise of 30 foot and two inches, which means that the, the amount of level of water between the, the bottom pound, where I, I came into the lock, and the top pound is quite far. So turbulent, here we go. Got a lot of water, I've got to really concentrate. It swirls you around quite a lot because effectively a whole lock is emptying into a chamber at once. Um, and you've just got to concentrate on what you're doing. Um, I'm keeping the boat quite back in the lock. Um, you'll see that I'm sort of buffed up against the, backs, the, the back gates. This is because there's a lot of water flow coming in at the front gates um, and I don't really want it uh, filling my bow. So I've had a bit of a problem with water this week. Um, I went away for the week last week and I left probably about a quarter of a tank of water in the main stainless steel tank. Um, on Saturday I picked up the boat. Um, it, it got quite warm in the week whilst being away, um, but didn't think anything of it. Saturday I filled, filled Alice up, filled the water tank up. Uh, just north of Ashwood Marina um, and carried on up the Staffordshire and Worcestershire Canal. I found a really nice mooring spot right out in the country, nice and quiet. I could get the car quite close because um, I sort of piggy, I jump ahead with the car and a bike, a fold away bike, um, so I can keep mobile all the time, especially whilst I'm fitting out. But Yesterday, the water started tasting a little bit strange. It, all I can describe is it's tasted as though um, 
not gone off, but gone stale. Um, a bit like a water in a glass sitting on a, a bedside cabinet for a couple of days and then you take a sip and it's got that sort of not very nice taste. So I stopped drinking straight away. I only drank bottled water yesterday and this morning and that meant I had to abandon the nice plan that I had to stay in the countryside where I was for a week um, and seek fresh water. So I emptied the tanks, had a really long hot shower this morning um, all the water's gone and the next point was the junction of the um, Staffordshire and Worcestershire Canal and the Shropshire Union. I was coming up onto the Shropshire Union anyway but that was where the next water point is so I filled up this morning um, the poor people behind me who said yeah that's fine you fill up that's fine um, I don't think they realised I needed to fill up what 475 litres of water so it took a bit of time so I'm really sorry um, now about Domino. Authorly stop block at the junction of Staffordshire and Worcestershire Canal and the Shropshire Union Canal had no more than one inch of water difference and everyone commented that it was hardly worth having a lock there at all but I'm sure there's a valid reason. There are some nice little shops and a boatyard here as well as bins, pump out and much needed water. Next time I start to travel up the Shropshire Union only to have a change of heart, direction and plan. Don't forget to click subscribe if you want to follow my journey. It doesn't cost anything and it informs you about new episodes. Click the thumbs up if you like this episode and until next time see you later.